Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, we're very happy to be here, and uh, uh, Shira's talk was fantastic, but uh, we're here to bring uh, stillness. <laughs> Absolutely no motion in our presentation, other than one slide into another. Um, so uh, I'm Neil Donnelly. I am a graphic designer uh, with a small studio in Brooklyn. Um, I'd say about half of our work is books and other publications, mostly for clients in art and architecture. And I'm Alan Rapp. I feel like a very exotic creature in this context after that introduction. Thank you, Alan. Um, I am an editor of publications, primarily print publications and primarily books, visual books. Um, but we are going to be talking about other kinds of publications and books today as well. Um, the editorial training that I had um, admonished us to really regiment the stages of content development, and that meant to always refine and revise and get something really, really clean before you transmit it to the designer. So all of the assets would be gathered together, and they are ready to typeset. So a very linear example of workflow. Um, but increasingly, I found that we are working on projects where um, content and form really co-evolve, and that's for a, a number of different factors, but um, increasingly where the inputs from one discipline interact with and condition the output of the other discipline. I think it's important that we acknowledge that you know, what we're describing here is by no means unique. Um, uh, you know, that this is a process that I think works for certain kinds of projects really well. Um, many of you, I'm sure, uh, participate in, in projects that work this way all the time. Um, but in essence, what we're talking about here is something where um, content, as Alan said, content and design are kind of evolving in parallel. Um, and then rather than this linear process uh, where one thing has to be done before someone else can start working with it, um, uh, everyone involved in the process is kind of working simultaneously and in contact with each other. And while this seems chaotic, and it certainly can be, um, it, it demands also that the author and the editor and the designer are in sync and thinking really systematically, um, trying to create systems that help to organize content uh, and design as they evolve simultaneously. So the two projects that we're going to talk about are the New City Reader, and Work AC will get there when we cross that bridge. Um, one a newspaper, one a book. Very different in genres, formats, and production timelines, but each is really emblematic of this way of working, where production factors and design are developed in parallel to each other and even um, outpacing the editorial content. And it seems, you know, in, in thinking about these two projects, uh, that I think architects and designers seem especially um, prone, if that's the right word, to, <laughs> uh, to wanting to work this way as authors. Um, and I think it probably has something to do with um, the way that they work uh, and, and on, on their day-to-day -day work. Um, and when it comes to creating content for a publication, um, you know, they, they often need a structure or a system or some kind of framework already in mind before they start developing the content as a, a way to, to help them create. So the New City Reader was a weekly publication uh, about the intersection of public space and information space. And it was published across 12 issues, 12 issues? I think that was right. Um, in the context of an exhibition at the New Museum in late 2010, early 2011 called The Last Newspaper. Um, now the idea of this publication was that it would be displayed in public, but um, from our point of view, another interesting feature was that um, our office was out in the open on the gallery floor during the museum hours, um, open to the public. So we were generating these weekly issues um, with a weekly kickoff meeting, and that is where uh, Neil and I would um, kind of lead the discussion amongst guest editors um, figure out what the issues were, plan the content, and um, Neil's ideation for various systems that go into the design started right there. Um, so the process in uh, um, the editorial and design generation and the distribution, which uh, these 
publications were free to museum goers during the context uh, or during the duration of the exhibition and also posted in public um, naturally lent itself to this kind of unconventional and collaborative workflow. And in addition to us inhabiting the museum, um, during our time there, the publication itself started to inhabit the museum in uh, <coughs> probably some surprising and, and unsurprising ways. <laughs> um, and each issue uh, was modeled on a typical section of a daily newspaper. So sections like city, sports, food, business, weather, obituaries, style and music, science, and classifieds. Um, and, uh, but all of these uh, separate issues were um, kind of investigating the theme of public space, but through the lenses of these newspaper sections. Uh, and as you can see, there's quite a lot of variation in terms of the display typography, and we were trying to, to respond to the particular content and that week's editors and the, and the themes involved. Um, and also, I think the, you know, thinking about the way that production conditions um, kind of help determine content and design approaches, um, we only had money to print this in black on newsprint, um, so there was never any color. And, and I think that degree of um, standardization in terms of the production process really allowed us to go out on some limbs when it comes to typography and still have the whole set feel um, kind of connected and, and all of a piece. Um, each issue al also had a different, um, what we call the wall arrangement. Um, because this was a newspaper that um, was expressly impossible to read like a, a normal newspaper, you know, in front of you, flipping pages, uh, it was meant to be read in public on a wall. Um, so the, the wall arrangement for each issue changed in response to that issue's themes and content. and. Um, it also, uh, I think, in some ways helped to kind of determine and structure the content. Sometimes the arrangements came kind of early on and seemed to, um, uh, the, the theme kind of begged for a particular arrangement that then the content uh, filled into. Um, and then to talk a little bit more about the kind of design system, you know, this was a situation in which we were working in, on the third floor of the new museum every week for three months, um, producing a paper every week and uh, we needed to set things up in a way that we could you know, have a really fast um, turnaround time. So there was a, a pretty flexible grid that we were using. There were certain elements of the typography that were consistent week to week. The body text was always Neutzeit um, because we, and it was quite large because we needed something that was robust and could be seen from a distance um, and also could stand up to the you know, demands of newspaper printing and being you know, wheat pasted to a wall. Uh, we were also using souvenir mono for captions and bylines as a way to add a kind of uh, flavor of a, a transcript that still had some quirk. Um, but then in addition to these um, consistent elements of, of the system, um, there, there was a lot of uh, variation, as I said before, in the display typography that where things could be kind of wildly different week to week even things like um, the title treatment for the, the paper itself um, could change in response to, to a particular set of content. So uh, like on the right here, um, this was the business section and you know any serious business section in 2010 was talking a lot about collapse. So <laughs> it seemed important to address that through the design. Right. Responsive type before responsive <laughs> type. Right. Um, so the resulting issues, which as Neil mentioned, each, uh, each one had a guest editor, usually um, an individual or usually a group with some kind of expertise in the area. Um, but the resulting issues were always really surprising just based on this um, somewhat improvisational but very, very intertwined workflow. And um, it seemed like there were so many constraints and so little time. Um, that we were, we were doing things on the fly and filling in um, gaps in the content, either editorially or you know, with design um, along the way. So um, probably my favorite issue that resulted was the food issue. And you know, in it, I would argue that we were really early adopters of what I think is now a pretty common understanding of how um, food 
is really central to the city life and reflects and defines the urban milieu. And the contributors to this um, issue, like many of our issues, were also really stellar. I'm just remembering that um, we had this interview with uh, the late, great LA Times food critic Jonathan Gold way back when, um, as well as a profile of the founder of TGI Fridays. And um, uh, the, this part is great. The, the graphic typology, a survey of graphic typologies of chicken joint signage, um, which all really came together and make us feel like it made us feel like we were really on top of our very odd mandate in this publication, um, that we could demonstrate big ideas about urban experience and information through amazing um, but true and emblematic content, right down to creating a parody um, fill in the blank supermarket value coupon circular, which is in the next slide. We were also trying to send the paper to print every week during the busiest two hours of the week at the museum, which was free night on Thursdays. So 7 p.m. every Thursday, the elevator doors would open <laughs> and you know, a mass of humanity would flood into the gallery, um, which led to us sometimes uh, decamping elsewhere to finish production, um, often somewhere where stiff drinks were available, um, followed a few days later by our intrepid editors uh, doing some wheat pasting themselves. So, um, you know, I think that was our first experience with this um, really fast-paced and fluid um, content not really being in place ahead of um, the design and production factors and everything having to kind of, you know, co-evolve with each other. Um, and also just had a, you know, novel twist in its very performative aspect. But from that uniquely ephemeral project, we um, both returned to uh, more traditional publications along the way. But here too, we started noticing that um, this kind of multimorphic and improvisational uh, ways of the New City Reader were really not that far off um, from our experience as we thought. Um, so years later, we would reunite uh, recent, more recently, I think we started talking about this in 2016, yeah. um, for a book project that in many ways couldn't be further from the constraints and the aims of the New City Reader, but in other ways really um, mapped to the intertwined processes that we had experienced and um, started having more knowledge of how to direct um, in the past. Um, work Architecture Company, or Work AC, is a, a New York-based architecture office um, founded by Amal Andraus and Dan Wood. And uh, their work is characterized by, I guess, what we could call a playful awareness of architecture history, color, and nonlinear concepts, um, decidedly not uh, modernist or minimalist. Uh, maximalist is probably a fair, yeah. fair way to describe them. Um, and the title, uh, we'll get there when we cross that bridge, was actually a, a malapropism that Amal uttered during one of our early meetings. Um, which seemed both entirely fitting for their practice, you know, the, the idea of looking past the bridge to what's on the other side of it. Um, but I think this inversion also reflects this working process that we're describing today. Right. So by the time that we started working on the book in earnest, um, the authors had already determined a, a sort of content and thematic based structure. Um, that would really inform how the um, content itself would develop into design and then in a more interesting uh, level yet actually got into a lot of number uh, a number of production features um, they devised thematic silos featuring one emblematic project paired with um, an issue that that project really um, explored and represented and even as the project selection for everything else and all the other elements were being sorted out. And I think from the beginning, Amal and Dan were describing this book as their duograph rather than monograph. Um, and initially, I think they were thinking of it as, you know, the, the two of them as two different voices within the book, but uh, it also sort of evolved into a structural idea that, um, uh, that you see here where there's a main project followed by an issue related to that project. Uh, this is also, um, a, a version of this content diagram that uh, came from Amal and Dan on, uh, I think from our first meeting about this project and I just scrawled notes all over it during the course of the meeting. And I think looking back at this, um, it's instructive and satisfying 
to see that a lot of these things that were present in the kind of earliest stages, stages of uh, discussion of this book um, ended up being present in the final product. Um, things like text should not be pretentious. <laughs> um, the, uh, book should have uh, personal, a personality, the personality of the office. See, I can't even read my own writing. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and shitty tank top photos versus polished drawings and, and photos. Um, and then we, we spent a lot of time developing the design approach in relation to this idea of kind of two separate kinds of content um, that were still related to one another. Um, and we went through a number of different ways of approaching this. Uh, but I think it really didn't kind of snap into clarity until um, uh, Amal offered some feedback by email that included the sketch that you see on the left, uh, making a distinction between the primary and secondary sections of the book. Um, and she also said, the main projects are 16 pages with beautiful big images, space, and luxurious layout. There is no text except for an introductory conversation. Text and images are separated. The secondary sections are 16 pages, not of projects per se, but of moments from various projects that embody an idea, an investigation, an atmosphere. There is more freedom in the layout and having text wrap around as you had it. It's more playful and there is more diversity in the range of layouts and scale of images. It's a selection of images that together form some kind of argument assembled around an issue and a set of questions. Images and text are woven together. I think the text could at times feel like stitching, like a connecting set of lines. There are also the wink moments, the small doodles, et cetera, which give these sections character. So the, the finished result, um, I was gonna say the manufactured result, and that's accurate, but somehow, you know, it sounds too final, and this, pro this project almost never felt final. But you can kind of see what was going on from this really nice photograph, that the design and the production features um, could actually be read editorially. Those aren't just sort of arbitrary um, colors that you're seeing on the fore edge, but it indicate something about the editorial structure um, that the projects themselves were printed on coded stock and, and you can't quite see it, but there's a little bit of a notching in the fore edge too, and that's because we were alternating page widths. Um, the, the projects were on coded stock and on uh, narrower pages and, uh, th well, the dialogues, duologues, and the other thematic discussions were printed on uncoded stock and were on wider pages. And in terms of the typography, um, we were looking, again, to, to evoke the personality of the office through this book in a very spare, clean, minimal monograph, um, just wouldn't make any sense for, for Work AC's practice. Um, and so we were looking for a way to make the typography connect to um, the kind of radical architecture publishing of the 60s and 70s, the um, kinds of um, architects that, that have had a strong influence on Amal and Dan's practice. So we were using American Typewriter for the issues sections and Antique Olive for the project sections. Um, and so we're also then, uh, through the typography, distinguishing between main projects and, and issues as well, kind of reinforcing that dichotomy. Um, and then along with those other features that were mentioned, uh, the page widths and the alternating stocks, we also introduced a chronological access um, by breaking the book into five-year sections that delineated their 15-year career. So these fluorescent spot colors distinguished one era from the next, and they also had a slogany um, sort of uh, section title that described what was going on during that era. And these, um, these era overviews offered a kind of behind the scenes look at the, the very blurred boundaries between the personal and the professional as Dan and Amal, besides being uh, work partners and principals of the firm, are married. So the slides that uh, we're looking at here really demonstrate the kind of evolution of a family and the evolution of an office. And the evolution of cakes that look like buildings. <laughs> Um, and the layout and design differences between the two sections, uh, I think, are, are quite evident, not just through the typography, but also through the use of the page. Um, the main project sections are, as Amal said, lots of big, beautiful images, often full bleed, kind of maximizing the available space on the coded stock. Uh, and then the issue sections that immediately follow 
um, had a little bit wider page width, as Alan mentioned, uncoded stock, um, much larger type, and, and the conversation between Amal and Dan um, really helps to kind of drive the image selection and, and placement in these sections. Um, and the type sort of runs between and over and through and around images, um, and it's sort of the messy back of house compared to the more polished front of house of the main projects. So here we go back to the initial mapping um, in that first meeting, the content outline that um, Neil translated into a really spiffy uh, sort of final result that uh, kind of does it all. This is, th uh, if, if one spent a little bit more time with it than blowing through on the slide, really maps editorial content to design to production and has them all together in one. And this book map also, uh, I think, kind of serves to map all of those things too, quite literally. Um, this was a tool that we used really and, and kind of updated throughout the process uh, that you know, shows the, how many pages can uh, make up each signature, um, where there's uncoded stock, where there's coded stock, where the spot colors are and which ones are being used in each signature. Um, so uh, in a way, in addition to this being a kind of functional, useful thing, it also is a kind of very visible editorial and design synthesis and in a way kind of like a plan drawing for building the final product. Um, and then last fall, we were very graciously invited to uh, lead a workshop at MICA so by Ellen. And um, the workshop was uh, where we really took this synthetic idea and used it as the brief, um, a premise for the workshop and had the students um, develop uh, take their developing thesis research and apply it to a combined publication, combined in the sense that they would make up their own publication that would been, be bound in together with the results of everyone else's. And um, they would take one weekend to concept, write, edit, and um, design and produce this publication and uh, really make it, you know, kind of like the fulfillment of where they were in terms of their research at the time, but forced to immediately just um, refine it and output it and come and put it together with everyone else's. And we found uh, that this one, this slide on the right uh, has a one on it because we thought we were going to put them all together in one volume, but the content was too much. It exceeded <laughs> the boundaries. So um, the we boundaries ended up with two. Machine. That's true. The, and so we ended up with two. Yeah, and I think the, the interesting thing for us about this workshop as an exercise was that this way of working started for us as practice. Um, but the workshop gave us a chance to turn it into theory and kind of deploy it to students who could then turn it back into practice again. So it adds another level of inversion and I think w for us was a really satisfying experiment uh, or next step in this ongoing experiment. Which we ultimately applied also, not surprisingly, into the development of this presentation. Uh, today. This is a, s a slide from uh, yesterday. Um, sitting out on DeKalb Avenue in Brooklyn, having been kicked out of a cafe for having our laptops out. Um, so, uh, you know, the bar around the corner wasn't open yet, and there we were on a bench on the sidewalk, working once again very performatively out in the open, transparently yep. and collaboratively um, in parallel, simultaneously editing and designing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.